When the residents of Vault 76 emerged from the safety of their vault 25 years into the post-apocalypse, they found Appalachia to be practically uninhabited. It wasn't the nuclear war of 2077 that had destroyed society though, it was a plague that had emerged years later. This man-made sickness known as the Scorched Plague was carried by massive, mutated bats called Scorch Beasts. These beasts spread plague across the population of Appalachia, converting them into monsters that served them. These former residents of Vault 76 quickly found a nearly finished vaccination for the disease and completed it. They then turned their efforts to stopping the beasts. With a combination of heavy weapons, power armor, and tactical nuclear weapons, the residents of Vault 76 managed to defeat the Queen of the Scorch Beasts. The news that Appalachia was once again safe enough for habitation spread. In 2103, some of those who had fled in the face of extinction returned home, along with a number of newcomers seeking a better life. While the Raiders of the Crater and the Settlers of Foundation would become the largest bodies of residents in the region, another group would arrive to tap into the emerging market. I'm the Irresolute Cartographer, and this is the story of that group, the Blue Ridge Caravan Company. The roots of the Blue Ridge Caravan Company run back to the years before the bombs. In those days, it was a shipping company running goods up and down the Blue Ridge Parkway. The head of the company then and now, Joanna Mayfield, inherited the business from her grandfather. When the bombs brought an end to the old world, the company switched from trucks to Brahmin caravans. Fueled by grass and capable of walking on the uneven roads that remain, the Brahmin caravan is the method of operation used by most post-war merchants. With business along the Blue Ridge Parkway re-established, the company expanded their operation into Appalachia in 2103. Entering the area from the east, they needed to find a way across the mountains of the Savage Divide and into the Fertile Forest region. They met this need with a Big Bend Tunnel. Built before the war as a passage for the raw materials of Appalachia to travel under the mountains and out to the east coast, this tunnel had been utilized as late as the 2090s. It was at that time home to a group of raiders who had broken with the extreme cutthroat raiders of the Pleasant Valley Ski Resort. They made a life at the western terminus of the tunnel, venturing deeper into the tunnel to scavenge supplies. On one of these trips, they met the Appalachian Brotherhood of Steel at the east end of the tunnel. This turned into a friendly relationship that lasted until August of 2095, when the Brotherhood forces suddenly and inexplicably disappeared from the eastern tunnel mouth. After that, more and more Scorched Plague victims stumbled into the tunnel until the reformed raiders of Big Bend Tunnel were wiped out. As the post-war society was falling to the onslaught of the Scorched, the responders, the largest organized group west of the mountains, attempted to blow the tunnel. They hoped to keep it from becoming a channel for the Scorched to pass into their territory. They failed in this effort, but their loss was the gain of the Blue Ridge Caravan Company, as they found the tunnel mostly intact when they arrived seven years later. In preparation for the tunnel to once again carry cargo, the new owners cleared old train cars from the tracks, reinforced the walls, and built a path atop the rails for the Brahmin to walk upon. While this path is far shorter and less exposed than the path over the top of the Savage Divide, it unfortunately still comes under the attack of the Blood Eagle Raiders, seeking the goods the caravans haul. In response to these assaults, the caravan has set up outposts in parts of the tunnel and hires on additional help to guard the convoys on their way through. In 2104, the head of the company, Joanna Mayfield, arrived in Appalachia, setting up a local headquarters for the Blue Ridge Caravan in the encampment to the west of the Big Bend Tunnel. It was around this time that a new problem began to rear its head. The Blue Ridge Caravan Company might be primarily in the business of protecting cargo shipments, but they also safely transport people along their trade routes, opening up regional travel to the less combat-savvy wastelander. One of these trade routes, a hidden path running along the remains of an old Bish Company natural gas pipeline, began to have disappearances. Customers would simply vanish in the night, leaving the caravan before reaching their destination. This was mildly concerning, but it got much more worrying when an entire caravan disappeared. Before they could investigate these disappearances on their own, they were confronted by another recently arrived organization, the Brotherhood of Steel. Though the original Appalachian Brotherhood of Steel had been wiped out by the Scorched back in August 2095, their brothers in California had dispatched a cross-country expeditionary force that arrived in 2103. While establishing themselves in the area, the new Brotherhood experienced an uptick in the number of super mutants stalking the countryside. As they investigated this growing menace, the agents of the Brotherhood stumbled onto the fact that wastelanders were disappearing from across the wasteland. 
At the old headquarters of Atomic Mining Services in Watoga, they discovered documents that potentially pointed to the Blue Ridge Caravan Company as being behind the disappearances. Paladin Leila Romani, the head of the expedition, had previously been attempting to cut a deal with the Blue Ridge Caravan Company and had received no response to her entreaties. This snubbing, combined with the documents found at AMS, raised the Paladin's suspicions. She set off for the Caravan Company's local headquarters to meet with Joanna Mayfield. Though the Paladin arrived in disguise, the well-informed Joanna Mayfield was not fooled, but she met with Paladin Romani regardless. She told the Paladin that they had no interest in any arrangement with the Brotherhood and that they were not behind the disappearances. Further, she informed them about the full caravan that had disappeared and offered assistance in tracking down the culprits. To this end, Miss Mayfield assigned one of the company guards, Ares, to guide the Brotherhood to the caravan's last known location in the Harper's Ferry train tunnel. In following this lead, the Brotherhood discovered that the culprit behind the disappearances was in fact a scientist named Dr. Edgar Blackburn. Further investigation found that Dr. Blackburn was running experiments on these kidnapped people. Thanks to the Brotherhood's swift actions, some members of the caravan were saved. The news of this rescue was welcomed by Joanna Mayfield, but she still didn't want to make a deal with the Brotherhood. When questioned on why, Ms. Mayfield explains that she had nothing to gain. The company had gotten by just fine without them, and the only thing the Brotherhood would bring to the table is telling them what they can and can't do while taking a cut of their profits. With the story, up to now at least, of the Blue Ridge Caravan Company itself covered, let's look at the stories of a few of the employees. We've already talked about the owner, Joanna Mayfield, so let's move on to the next most senior operative in the area, Vinny Costa. Vinny Costa operates out of the Blue Ridge Caravan Company base at the east end of the Big Bend Tunnel, where he can be found wearing a clean suit and practically perpetually drinking coffee. His job appears primarily to be coordinating the caravan's movements through Big Ben Tunnel. He sends pairs of merchants and guards through, along with any temporary guards he can hire from the local population. As for those merchants and guards that move through the tunnel, there are three pairs. The first of these pairs is Kieran Kennedy and Eugenie. Jarl Balgriff, sorry, Kieran Kennedy, is very serious and focused when on the job. His main motivation in working for the caravan is to earn as many caps as he can. He's worked other jobs, but he inevitably comes back to working as a gun for hire. His tough demeanor hides a softer side, as the money he earns here is in service of paying for the care of a number of orphans that he's taken in. A letter from one of these children, Hannah, reveals that he's taught these children to read and has hired protection to keep them safe while he's away on business. Eugenie also has a community that she's looking out for. In her case, it's an all-ghoul settlement that sprang up to protect these vulnerable people from bigoted, ignorant outsiders that sought to murder them. After hiding out for a decade, she re-entered the outside world and found work as a merchant. She says that people are generally less hostile when you come into town with a load of goods, but that it also doesn't hurt to be heavily armed. The second pair of guard and merchant is Libby Wynn and Carver Timmerman. Libby Wynn was born into a military family and raised in an almost boot camp-like setting. This background has given her a very professional persona when it comes to how she approaches her work. She chose to leave her family camp near the capital behind as she both felt like she didn't completely fit in and she believed that her parents and siblings were more than capable of keeping themselves safe. She looks for opportunities to reward hard work and pays for the drinks of those that she works with. Her skill and professionalism has led her to become the preferred caravan guard of Eugenie. Carver Timmerman could scarcely be more different than Libby. Born in Appalachia to Gregory and Deborah Timmerman not long before the bombs, Carver was not a well child. Sometime after the war, Deborah Timmerman and her girlfriend Shelley Van Lowe moved to Kentucky where they worked as trappers. Though he's not temperamentally inclined towards working the caravan route, Carver's mother isn't well enough to do the job anymore, and Shelley has to work as a trapper to supply the skins that they trade. Carver appears to be romantically interested in Libby, but she either isn't interested in the relationship, or at least she doesn't want to discuss it while on the job. The last pairing of guard and merchant is Ares and Rudy Fernandez. Ares is something of an enigma when you first meet him, but it becomes clear over time that he is in fact the missing and presumed dead Calvin Van Lowe. Before attending vault Tech University, Calvin Van Lowe was the head of a cryptid hunting group. When he graduated, he went to work for the Bish Company, an energy company that primarily produced natural gas. When Bish was interested in producing natural gas on the land occupied by the people of Lewisburg, they used Calvin Van Lowe's knowledge of local cryptid lore to produce a scheme worthy of an episode of Scooby-Doo. 
Calvin would produce an imposter sheep squatch that would scare people in the area off their land and drive down property values so that Bish could buy the land up cheap. When Calvin attempted to add a sheep squatch mating ritual to the imposter sheep squatch's operations, a mistake in the installation process led the modified Assaultron to nearly kill him. He crawled away, clinging to life, and managed to save himself. Thanks to the mishap, he has to breathe through a respirator to survive. After wandering the wasteland for a time, he returned to the area and came to work for the Blue Ridge Caravan Company, likely bringing the old Bish Company pipeline route to their attention. Though he doesn't say exactly why he's returned to and stayed in the area, I believe it's a combination of his love of the hunt of the sheep squatch and the fact that he can now work with his stepnephew, Carver Timmerman. Rudy Fernandez, the usual partner for Ares, is the child of a family that produces pepperoni rolls in a facility he says is not unlike Mama Dolce's in Morgantown, less the communist robots. After his brothers got tired of his antics as the company comedian, they sent him out on the road to sell their product. The Blue Ridge Caravan Company employs these pairs of guards and merchants elsewhere as well. Every other week or so, Tommy Tintoes and Minerva visit the major settlements of Appalachia. Minerva grew up in Washington, D.C., where she was on the day of the bombs. Luckily, her local library doubled as a bomb shelter and she survived the war. As she got older, she displayed a photographic memory and incredible drawing skills that combined to give her the nickname of the Human Copying Machine. When a bookseller in the Blue Ridge Caravan Company witnessed her talents, he took her on as an apprentice. She traveled with him and came to view the company as her family. When her mentor died, she went from selling books to copying schematics and selling these copies. She now travels the wastes with Tommy Tintoes as her constant bodyguard and companion. Tommy Tintoes is an intimidating sight. A tall, powerfully built ghoul with a shady past, Tommy describes his job as a lot of walking, a bit of shooting, mostly just standing around looking all intimidating like. Minerva both describes Tommy as a big goofy teddy bear and claims that he's been known to rip out the sternums of thieves. Once known as Tommy the Nose, since his ghoulification, he's become known for an incredible physical deformity, the tin toes on his right foot. This would surely be an incredible sight and one that he is eager to mention, but unfortunately Minerva has forbidden him from showing his foot. Tommy likes to talk to the customers even if he's not the draw of their operation, and enjoys talking about zoos and his love of animals. Lastly, we'll look at the local company bartender, Herschel Klein. Herschel refers to his bar at the western mouth of the Big Bend Tunnel as Herschel's Curated Liquors of Choice, a joke about the constantly changing stock of scavenged booze. He serves these drinks with a side of bologna, supposed rumors that he's heard including Rudy's pepperoni rolls being made of people, Brahmin having their brains in their udders, Paladin Romani being a traveling acrobat, and ghoulification being caused by Nuka-Cola. When asked about the company he's a part of, he gripes that everyone wants to know about the company, and not him. He complains that no one wants to read his memoirs, My Life at the End of the World, a Herschel Klein story, a book that he claims has a foreword by Billingsley and Mr. Handy at the Bolton Greens Country Club. That's about all that I could find on the Blue Ridge Caravan Company and its employees, but I've got a few thoughts on this content before closing things out. First, the Blue Ridge Caravan Company is working hard, not smart, at least when it comes to the Big Bend Tunnel itself. This should be one of the easiest legs of the trip, not one of the hardest. What I mean by this is that they could make a couple of improvements, and traversing this tunnel would be both quick and safe. The rails in the tunnel are still intact but instead of using Brahmin teams to pull the cargo on train cars or even working to electrify the track to drive cargo through the tunnels, they treat this train tunnel like any other section of road and they walk on it. They could even simply have the caravans board flatbed train cars and ride through the tunnel. Along with this, it's a tunnel. There shouldn't be blood eagle attacks when you're going through. If they would take the time and properly seal the holes in the tunnel, it would make things much safer. Second, when Joanna Mayfield tells us that the Blue Ridge Caribbean Company is operating along the Blue Ridge Parkway, she's telling us two things. One, that the Blue Ridge Parkway is intact and operational, and two, that there are other areas of civilization to the south and east of Appalachia. The Blue Ridge Parkway is a 469 mile long highway that runs from northern central Virginia to western North Carolina. The only reason it would make sense for the Blue Ridge Caravan Company to operate on this road is if there is business to be had there. This means that there are likely several inhabited towns that lie on that road, which is great to hear. Just for a little more context on where it's located in relation to what we see in Appalachia, 
Its northern terminus is just 80 miles east-northeast of White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, home to the Greenbrier Resort, which is represented in-game by the White Spring. Third, from conversations with Ares, it seems that while the caravan guards work for the Blue Ridge Caravan Company, most of the merchants don't. Instead, the majority of the merchants appear to just travel with the Blue Ridge Caravan. With this understanding, I now see the Blue Ridge Caravan Company as a mix of shipping company and private military corporation. Fourth, as former dwellers of Vault 76, players can act as temporary guards for the caravans passing through the tunnel, working with three pairs of merchants and guards. These pairs are Ares and Rudy, Kieran and Eugenie, and Libby and Carver. While the player can only interact with them in these specific pairings, in the lore, they seem to trade off partners relatively often. Fifth, I assumed that Calvin Van Lowe was dead in my Lewisburg lore video because it really seemed like he was. There's a hole in the wall, a huge amount of blood. And the subtitles for the encounter with the imposter sheep squatch says, quote, death whales, unquote. Calvin Van Lowe is a fun and interesting character, so I'm glad he didn't die in that incident. Sixth, Tommy Ten Toes mentions an incident in Chattanooga in the past. This has led me to wonder if the Blue Ridge Caravan Company does business there. Chattanooga, Tennessee is approximately 116 miles west-southwest of the southwestern terminus of the Blue Ridge Parkway, so it seems possible. Alright, I think that's enough on the story of the Blue Ridge Caravan Company. If you want to receive notifications when I launch these lore videos, you can follow me on Twitter at Gaming with Maps. I've been streaming on YouTube lately, I'm currently streaming most Tuesday and Thursday evenings and Saturday afternoons, so come by if you're interested. Lately I've been playing either the Dead Space series or Elden Ring. If you appreciate what I do here and you want to support the channel financially, you can become a patron with Patreon. I want to thank my patrons Mesothelioma, 76 of Texas, Jill AWS, Dark Malcontent of Metaverse Studios, and Brian for their support. This has been the Irresolute Cartographer. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.